on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware uh hello everybody it is sunday august the 11th 2024 uh it's election season early election season but nonetheless election season the new york times today is full of all sorts of stories about harris and Vance, and Waltz, and of course Trump, so is CNN, lots of interviews. We're about to, I think, experience one of the more intense American elections uh, are in history. Uh, and it provides often an opportunity in some ways for parents to figure out what they should and shouldn't tell their kids about politics and about what it means to be a citizen in the United States. My guest today, Lindsay Cormack, has a new book out about it. It's called How to Raise a Citizen and Why It's Up to You to Do It. And she's joining us from the Upper East Side in New York City today. Um, Lindsay, do, do elections provide a good opportunity or a bad opportunity for raising citizens as our televisions and internet are full of all sorts of truths and untruths, all sorts of uh, propaganda about politics. Elections are a perfect time to do this work because we know that it's like a heightened media environment. You can't really avoid it no matter your age. And so it's a really good time for parents to talk to their kids. Tell me a little bit more about this notion of raising a citizen. Um, we had, uh, I know uh, your book got blurbed by Julie uh, Lifcott Haynes. Um, she was on our show last year. Uh, her book, uh, How to Raise an Adult, Break Free of the Overparenting Trap and Prepare Your Kid for Success was a huge success in itself. Um, how central, in your view, is the parent in providing an education of citizenship for their children? They're increasingly central because right now our schools have some really big constraints that make it very hard to transmit the necessary lessons for kids to understand these things. And so if I could like wave a magic wand, I'd make it so that, you know, K through 12, we teach these things and our kids grow up and they graduate and they know how to participate. But that's not the world we live in. So that's why I wrote this book, because it's up to parents to do a lot of this work. Is it about... Education. Uh, I know that uh, on your website, you ask your readers if they know the basics of the branches of the US government, the highest court, the levels of government that administer elections. Is that the core issue of preparing one's kids to be a citizen? Or is it something more philosophical, something broader? No, I, I think it is something broader. I mean, we don't need to raise a bunch of like government trivia experts. That's not really what this moment needs. We need kids who understand how to exercise their power and we need them to be practiced in having hard conversations. It's not just an educational piece. There's this cultural shift that I'm calling for. I grew up in the Midwest where a lot of people couldn't talk about politics. It was considered taboo or it's like in the realm of talking about sex or money or religion. And our politics are not going to get better unless we're willing to talk about this. And we have to teach our kids how to do that sort of practice. Why uh, in the Midwest is talking about politics like talking about sex? You know, it's hard for me to say exactly why, but I know that there were etiquette manuals that were published throughout the United States, but tended to take hold in the Midwest where it was something where it was seen as something that could make whoever you're with uncomfortable. It might be seen as undermining a guest or if you're hosting something that makes people not want to be there. And so it's something where a lot of cultural gatherings and a lot of things that mean, mean things to people in the Midwest just don't involve talking politics in an open and calm way. But doesn't it also, isn't it, can it be um, impolite? I mean, people feel so strongly about their politics, particularly these days in America, that perhaps those uh, manuals of politeness were right. It's best to be avoided if you want to maintain the peace 
of your Thanksgiving dinner or your tea party? Yeah, so there's certainly times and places that might feel more or less normal to do this in. But I think we're looking at it in a little bit of a trickier way. I don't know anyone who thinks our politics feels and functions that well right now. So keeping your peace at one dinner is not going to be something that helps our overall politics. And that's sort of the big argument of the book is we have to talk about this. We think someone else is going to fix it. Politics is going to get better. But the reality is no one's coming to save us. It's up to us to be willing to do this work. So the great question, Lindsay, about the book, How to Raise a Citizen and Why It's Up to You to Do It, is what's your definition of a citizen in a, the Democratic Republic of the United States? What, what, do, what do you mean by this word citizen? Yeah, citizen can be a really charged word. And I have something in the first chapter about what it is that I mean when I say this. I don't mean it in like a, a legal definition where it says, you know, you're entitled to these rights or not. A citizen is anyone who has agency in a system in which they live to change it. And so it's very broad. Children are citizens. Can they vote? No, but they are citizens here. And we need to raise them with all the powers that they'll get when they do turn 18 and are eligible to vote. I'm not clear, though, of that answer. I mean, what should you tell your kids that it's true? Perhaps your responsibility to vote, uh, although many Americans don't, more Americans don't vote than voters in many other countries. Is it one's responsibility as a citizen to go to one's local school board, to read newspapers, to keep up to date with the news? Uh, what, what exactly is being a citizen? Yeah. So Good citizen, that is, of course. I'm sorry, what was this last part? Good citizen. Oh, yeah. It's someone who understands and is capable of changing the world that they live in. And so does that mean voting? Yes. When I go through the five things that I think your kids have to know before they leave your house, the first one is all about voting. They need to understand how to register. They need to understand what the deadlines are. They need to understand how to actually do it. And so I do think that's an important part. Do you have to read a newspaper every day? No, not necessarily. But all these things are building blocks to getting to something that looks like a person who's powerful and capable of changing their world. Why, Lindsay? Some people might say, well, I'm happy to live in a liberal system like the United States. I'm free to vote if I want, but I, I find politics rather boring. I'm busy with other things. Why, why is being a good citizen actually being involved in politics? Well, I don't really take a normative stance on good or bad here. It's just someone who has the power to do it, someone who knows how to exercise their power. And I know that some people are happy with the politics that happen where they are. That's probably true in local areas. I really don't know that many people that are happy with how national politics sounds. And so if we think that something's going to change, it has to change with us. Like, I think a lot of times people think they're sort of like on this boat of democracy or politics. And they're just like sort of watching it go by and they don't realize they're not passengers. They're crew members like we are the system. And so if we want a better thing, we have to do it better. Is there a and it sounds to me as if there is in some ways a, a kind of communitarian ethic at the heart of your book? I mean, I suppose so, because here's the thing. Politics is a, it's unavoidable. Like it's going to happen to us whether we like it or not. And so we might as well understand the system that we're being thrown into. And so, yes, that's communitarian. It's not necessarily ideologically communitarian, but it's the reality that we live in. How disappointed. I know you teach at uh, the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken in New York. Uh, so you're pretty well acquainted with young Americans. How disappointed are you with the level of knowledge of your students, for example, with American politics, with the political system? So I actually wouldn't describe myself as disappointed in them. I think I'm disappointed in a system that lets them down. Because for every other subject, we sort of build from K through 12. We start with little concepts and vocabulary. We build to bigger concepts. We get to harder and trickier things. The way that we teach government in most United States is to wait until the second semester of the senior year of high school to have one little government class. And so they don't know a lot, but I don't hold them at fault for that. It's us who have changed the way that we do schools so they can't really get this knowledge. And one of the reasons I wrote this book is to point that out to parents. Like if you think schools are gonna do it, on average, they're really not. Most of my students come in and they don't know very basic things about the government. What are your models for societies or systems that are better at raising citizens than the United States? Of course, people often go back to antiquity, to Athens in particular, Socrates being the model. Others look to countries perhaps like Australia, where uh, voting is required legally. Do you have models 
outside the United States, either in time or geography, uh, where uh, the societies do a better job collectively in raising citizens? That is a great question. I don't consider myself a comparativist, so I don't really look into the systems in other countries. And so that's not really a referent point that I have. And in terms of how we've done it over time, there are times that seem like a little bit better and a little bit worse. Prior to the Cold War, we had an educational system that was just sort of getting on, like in a, everyone's going to public school, K through 12 is normalized. And there was more of a focus on teaching how to be a citizen, how to understand your government. That has declined. And so I think there are times in which we can look back to, and it's just about prioritizing what we're gonna focus on in schools. Uh, your book got blurb not just by Julie Lithcott Haynes, who is the author of How to Raise an Adult, who was on the show, but also David Daly. Uh, Daly was actually on the show a couple of days ago. Um, he has a new book out about the American Republican Party. It's called Anti-Democratic, Inside the Far Right's 50-Year Plot to Control American Elections. I think if he was on the show, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I think he would argue that the Republican Party does a far worse job at raising citizens, so to speak, than the Democratic Party. Um, would you agree with Daly? Is there a problem in America when it comes to politics, particularly the politics of the right, what some people see as the anti-democratic politics of the American right? Yeah, I actually listened to that when you were talking to David. Um, I don't know that I actually have as much as a partisan look on this, because I actually don't think it's important that we raise kids to be little partisans. I think it's important that we raise them to understand the rules of the game and know that they will pick the parties that suit them. Like the parties change, the players change, the people change. So I don't I don't much say, you know, like, here's how you raise a little Republican or here's how you raise a little Democrat. I do think that he is right in pointing out that there are some parts of the Republican Party that have made it harder for people to participate. And that can be seen as something that's working counter to, to citizenry or being able to wield your own power. But I don't know that that means you're not raising citizens. It, it means if you're controlling school boards, if you're changing policies, if you're controlling state houses, then you're actually doing politics. My childhood was a little bit of time ago, embarrassing amount of time ago now, Lindsay. But from what I can remember, I was much less interested in the mechanics of government, in the rules, the laws, than in the participants, in the politicians themselves. Some were inspiring, some were scary, some were boring. I'm guessing the same is true in the United States today, particularly with politicians as distinctive and controversial as Donald Trump, obviously, but even uh, Harris on the Democratic side. What is the role um, for parents in raising citizens in terms of using these national figures either as, as, as models or warnings? Yeah, I mean, national figures in election time is why it's a, a good sort of winnowing theory to talk about these sort of things with kids. I think that it's something where you can look at the actual footage of the candidates with your children. Let them watch the debates with you. Let them see how, how they experience it. Because we all have a very good ability to say, like, I like something or I don't. And so it's not so much about saying to them, here's how you should think about this or here's who you should like. It's about exposure. It's about knowing that they can come to you on these questions, on these topics and care about it with you. That's something that we don't really have a culture of doing. We like don't really know how to talk to our kids about these things. And oftentimes we just don't include them. But don't we need to be honest about ourselves, Lindsay, that none of us are unbiased and that particularly in an age in America absolutely, absolutely. divisions it's very hard to say give a, a, a civic education to your child about Donald Trump without either describing him as the devil or some sort of saint yeah and I think that's kind of a problem in US politics right now where it's like if, if you disagree with someone they're evil they're either evil or stupid. And we know that, you know, you can paint those caricatures at the national level, but that sort of rhetoric or narrative being on every part of politics is part of the problem. Most of the people who are working in state and local government who control so many of our quality of life decisions are not either. They're people who are doing their best at jobs that don't pay that well because they think they're trying to make their communities better. And so while I understand there's a lot of stuff in federal politics that's frustrating, Part of the reason that I wrote this is for us to sort of widen the scope and make sure our kids know that there's a lot of good politicians, a lot of good elected officials doing things that they're just trying to make like a better version of the world as they see it. 
uh, using the two vice presidential candidates, Tim Waltz and, 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 and J.D. Vance, do they both fit into that model? I, certainly Waltz sounds as if he does. In fact, that's his brand of being an ordinary fellow, just doing his best to make the world a better place. Well, you know, and, and Governor Walls has been a teacher. He has a social studies background. He has been a coach. He's been around kids. And so, you know, this is written far before he's selected. But he does sort of echo some of the things that I echo, which is we need to teach them about these things. We need to show them how to participate. We want them to like this system because it depends on them. If we keep raising our kids to say like, oh, you know, you got to opt out of politics. They're all egomaniacs or they're horrible or they're liars. They're not going to want to make it better. They're not going to want to get involved. And so it's something where I think we have to change the narrative. And I think he's a good messenger for that. Do we need um, uh, Lindsay to de demythologize politics in the sense of, of, of suggesting to our kids that it's not really about a Trump or a Harris. It's really more about the many Tim Waltzes who you don't know who are rolling up their sleeves and doing a decent job improving the quality of local life. And, and, and much of being a citizen is really, particularly in America, given its federal system, is, is built on, um, on, on local politics. Yeah, that's, that's a big argument of this book. As I say, it's important that we humanize it. And what that means is making sure that your kids have opportunities to meet or get to know the legislators and executives at your state and local level. For instance, I was away with my niece about three weeks ago, and she hears me talk about this stuff. And she's like, Aunt Lindsay, who's my mayor? And I was like, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know where she lives. And I said, let's look it up. So we got online. We found out who her mayor was and we sent him an email. And I said, you know, I'm going to be in town in September. Would you like to meet us? Because I think my niece would really be interested in meeting you. And he got back to me within a week and was like, yes, and we've set it up. And so it's important that they just see that these are people. Because a lot of times kids have this idea that like there's like just this big government or something. There's like, you know, these people who are making decisions and you might see them on TV, but they don't really get it. I mean, a lot of times it's your neighbors who are making these decisions. It's the people who are working around your area. And so I do think it's important that we humanize it and let them see the people doing that work. I wonder if we've got a kids watching whether they really want an, an, uh, uh, an Auntie Lindsay who's going to introduce them to their local mayor. Aren't most of these people actually rather boring? Yeah, so so a lot of people think that and they think, you know, a lot of young teens or young adults are like, oh, I don't really care about this. But when we look at national surveys on this, upwards of 75 percent of them say they care about current events. They care about people who are in power. They just lack the know how. They just don't know these things. And so I don't really think it's a I don't care about this. Kids are trying to make sense of their world. They know that they're growing up into something. And so we sort of impart the way that we sometimes think about it. And I don't necessarily find that in the kids that I work with that are younger or college age. You have a niece. You also have a daughter who you advertise on your website. Um, have you dragged her? Is she into it? Have you, are you turning her into a good citizen? I mean, my daughter does a lot of things. She goes to like the state of the district, which is, you know, one of our executives or city council members say, here's what's happening in our district. I'm on our community board. She has to go to some of those meetings with me because oftentimes it's just me and her. So she's seeing this firsthand. And I'll tell you something that is interesting to me about that is I usually have to take her to the first day of school when I teach because my school starts a week or so before hers does. And so she gets to sit in when I give this pretest of all my undergrads. And she is amazed at how little they know. And she's been like that since she was like nine. And so it's, it's something where I, I think it's a good thing for her. She doesn't seem to say like, oh, I'm, I always hate this or it's boring. She knows what it is. It is sort of boring, but it's also really important. And it's not something that's like painful. So she pretty much goes along. How old is she now? 12 now. Sorry? She's 12 now. Yeah, I'll be. I hope you don't have any... Uh adolescent rebellion, uh, although, of course, adolescents often choose to find whatever annoys their parents and to embrace it. We are speaking uh, with Lindsay Cormack, who has a new book out. It's called How to Raise a Citizen uh, and why it's up to you to do it. Um, of course, it's preparing us for adulthood and responsibility to read uh, excellent books. Uh, political publications like Liberties, who are supporting our show. I'm going to run a short feature on Liberties, and then we'll be back uh, with uh, Lindsay Cormack to talk more broadly about what it's like to be a kid today, anxiety and politics. So don't go away. We'll be back in a second. The noise, there is nuance, insight. 
Liberty's it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberty's is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We're speaking with Lindsay Cormack, the author of How to Raise a Citizen. Uh, Lindsay, uh, Raising a Citizen, of course, is all about uh, childhood. Uh, your book comes with a blurb from Julie Lithcott Haynes, the author of How to Raise an Adult, uh, which is about breaking free of the over parenting trap. It's a very popular book. And there have been many books about the anxiety of children these days, stemming from social media and all sorts of other things. What's your analysis of the current state of uh, the American child when it comes to uh, understanding everything around them? Is there a broad crisis? Well, I think I think it's really difficult. I think you know we have different waves, at least that I've seen. I've been teaching for ten years. And I think the first five years that I was teaching, I saw kids that were deeply invested into their cell phones. That's sort of like where their world was. And then the last five years, I've actually seen something that looks like a swing back to say like, you know what, this doesn't feel good for me. It's not healthy for me to always be on here. So I I do think there is sort of some correction that's happening right now. But it's undeniable that we have a crisis of kids who are suffering from anxiety and depression, and it tends to be hitting girls more. I think Jonathan Haidt's work on this is pretty good. It has detractors, but I think he's mostly right on this. And one of the points that I make in this book is that we all want our kids to be mentally healthy. And some components of that are making sure that they understand the systems that they are a part of. Uncertainty is something that allows information that might not be true to sort of like hang out in your brain and be very scary. So if we can kind of give them the basics and let them feel rooted in the systems that they're in, they're probably more mentally prepared to handle all the different things that they're going to hear in the course of a lifetime about politics. Yeah, it's an interesting argument. Uh, So you're suggesting that uh, raising a good citizen might be one way to help them ward off mental illness of one kind or another? I think it absolutely does. And it's not only just the informational piece. I think if you get involved in local politics, that's a big part of it. Because when we think about local politics, that's something that relies on the in-person, routinized performance of people. And so there's a social aspect to that. And when we look at what a lot of kids are missing, and a lot of adults, frankly, is this idea of like dependable, socializing ties that give you some sort of sense of purpose. Local politics can be that. And oftentimes, it's not partisan. Like today, I was at a cleanup in my neighborhood. I, I'm in an organization that runs monthly cleanups, and it's just neighbors come together. We provide all the trash bags. We provide the trash pickers and the gloves, and you get to clean up your neighborhood and talk with other people about things. That sort of stuff is mentally buoyant. It like helps people. It, it helps people see each other. And so local politics is a way to do that sort of stuff, and kids would benefit from that sort of thing. What about global politics? What about raising a citizen of the world? Uh, the issue of Gaza, for example, now is very controversial, particularly amongst young people who are concerned with what they see as a genocide. Do you deal with that in the book? You know, all of that happens after the book is written. Um, And so, no, that's not a topic that's got into. I talk a little bit about January 6th, which is, you know, not global necessarily, but there's like a violent component to it. And so I think the sort of guidance that I give now when people ask about this is that if your kids can figure this out by going to Google or asking their Alexa, then you should be willing to do that work with them first. Because the stuff that they're going to encounter on the internet or in their phones, wherever, is probably going to be scarier. We know it's going to have a bias. You're going to have a bias too. But you can do a back and forth with them that the internet just can't do. And so I think it's important for us to have that sort of relationship with our kids and be willing to talk about those things, even if they are scary or seem bigger than them. What about complicated? I mean, politics is by definition, Lindsay, complicated. The Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, they're very controversial, different reads on what it means to be an African-American or a woman in America, given historical controversies, given the existence of slavery, given discrimination. How do you raise a citizen to make them aware of the complexity of these issues? Well, so that's a great question. It's very hard because, you know, we're not going to be experts on everything. And so it's too much, I think, to put on parents to be sure like, oh, your kids need to know every piece of this. I think they need to understand a process. And that's something that you can model 
for them and with them. So like if they come to you with a question about something, instead of saying like, I don't know, we'll talk about it when you're older, I think, and the way that I frame it in the book is you can say like, oh, let's go learn more together. And so I think it's like saying, let me show you how I can approach new topics. Not necessarily here's all the information on all these new topics, but sort of like breeding that curiosity, that ability to go to that second order question. I think that's important. And we often don't give it to them in politics. What about the issue of overparenting? That's a, a big issue, particularly uh, people in San Francisco and in the Upper West and East sides of New York. Uh, Julie Lithcott Haynes writes about that. Is there a danger that one can overparent a citizen, uh, Lindsay, go the other way and spend all your time talking about what it means to be a citizen to your nine or 10 year old? Yeah. So, I mean, there's nothing that I'm like, it's not like sit your kids down and lecture them, you know, every birthday party about dividing like cake and pizza is something about like dividing federal government resources. That's like not at all what I'm what I'm sort of going after. And so it's certainly possible to overparent on any sort of axes. I don't know that it's possible to overparent if the only outcome is, hey, I'm willing to talk to you about this. And hey, before you leave, I'm going to teach you how to participate in this system. I don't think that there's a true risk there. And I do believe a lot of what Julie Lithcott Haynes wrote. Her book was very inspiring to me. And I saw what she saw. You know, she's at Stanford. I'm at a tech school. Even these very capable, very bright students oftentimes come in lacking these sort of skills that we would have as college students even 10 years ago. And so I, I think she's right that handholding too much is a problem. But if we look at things like voter registration for 18 year olds, only about a quarter of them are registered. And so it's not necessarily handholding to get them to exercise a power that is theirs to wield. They just don't know how. Which political party is doing a better job? The Republicans are very active. We've done shows about their uh, involvement with young people. Democrats, of course, are too, particularly given the excitement now around Harris. Do you think the parties go about the idea of citizenship and educating young people in the same way in America? I mean, the parties have different strengths. Um, I think they, they both have strengths, they both have weaknesses. If we look at just empirical data, Younger voters right now tend to prefer the Democratic Party at least slightly, but there's also good evidence that Republican voters tend to like understand some of the how to more than them. And so they have different strengths. And we don't, you know, we don't really have like this nationalizing force of like, here's how Democrats educate kids or here's how Republicans educate kids. It's all the extended party network. It's all the sort of like sticky stuff about what it means to be a Democrat or a Republican. And they have different pros. They're good at different things. You've talked about your niece, you've got a daughter. What about the difference between raising a male and a female citizen? Are they the same things? Yeah, I, I think they're probably different. I can only speak to raising a daughter firsthand, but the school that I work at is about 70% male to female. And so I do get to be around a lot of young adult men. And I think sort of the things that are on their minds tend to be a little bit different than young adult women. And so there are different considerations. In the book, I talk about when my daughter asks me about abortion, because after the Dobbs decision came down, she heard that in school and we had never talked about it. And that's something that that means something different to her than I imagine it would to a boy who's not capable of carrying a baby later in life. And so, yes, it probably means different things in the same way raising boys and girls means different things in a whole bunch of areas. You mentioned that in the Midwest, sometimes talking about politics is like talking about sex. But for this younger generation, isn't in a way talking about politics, talking about sex, the issue of uh, what kind of sexuality, the trans issue, these are enormously uh, controversial political issues, particularly for young people. Um, so is, in a way, raising a citizen um, an attempt to, 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 to help them understand the issue of sexuality and citizenship? Well, I kind of think on any of these things that used to be taboo, it's probably better if we talk about it. And the way that I think about it is if you've ever had like a medical emergency, it might be scary. It might be daunting. It certainly has stuff that you don't know. And usually to get a better outcome, you go talk to people about it. You talk to a doctor, you get a second opinion, you talk to your friend who's a nurse, whatever. And so talking about hard things usually leads to a better outcome. So on all of these things, sexuality, drugs, alcohol, politics, I think we are better if we are willing to have the discussion versus not. Lindsay, you mentioned schools earlier. Uh, schools and reading are very much in the news. Uh, earlier this week, uh, 
Utah got into the headlines, uh, outlawing books uh, by uh, best-selling writers. In your view, I mean, obviously, you're a university college professor. Uh, you're not an expert necessarily on education. But are the schools doing a bad job in a, some of these book banning initiatives in places like Utah and Florida? Are they also contributing to uh, poor education when it comes to citizenship? Yeah, so I, I think there's like kind of a few things that work here. One is it's really hard to say schools in general are doing good or bad at X, because like you said earlier, we have a federalist system. You know, we have 50 different educational systems. And oftentimes it gets devolved onto school boards or county levels or whatever sort of municipal bodies responsible for that. So some schools do better, some schools do worse. But something that I do talk about in the book is that state legislatures are increasingly making it hard to talk about things in a way that helps kids understand civics. And I'll give you an example. In Texas, there was a law that was passed, I think 2018, that allowed students to do something that's known as action civics, which is you like group projects, you like find something in your neighborhood that you're like, oh, you know what? Our park doesn't have like functioning basketball courts. Let's go get, let's like see if we can make that happen. And you find who's responsible for that. Is it city council? Is it a mayor? Is it some other commission? Whatever. And you propose to them your thing. Now that doesn't succeed all the time. Oftentimes it doesn't, but you learn a lot in that action process. And now in the state of Texas, it's prohibited to have classroom activities where you're gonna be contacting elected or appointed officials. And so instead we sort of teach civics in this like theoretical way, instead of the way that people who are education experts say it actually sticks, which is with these practical hands-on action civic styles. And so some states are doing it better than others, but the idea that like we're making it harder to do this work in schools is one of the reasons that I think parents have to take it up. Is there a, a class element here in your in your book, uh, implicitly at least, uh, Lindsay, How to Raise a Citizen? You live on the Upper East Side of New York. Um, I live in San Francisco. Uh, we have the time and perhaps the economic resources and the education to raise citizens for uh, other other families, perhaps one parent families, families where the parent is having to work two or three jobs. Uh, it's much harder, isn't it, to raise a citizen? It's so much harder. I mean, every everything about participating in politics is a class issue. Everything, if you have less free time, you're going to have less time to dedicate to politics and understanding government. But something that we see is in under-resourced schools, these are the classes that get pushed aside. These are the things that get taught, like taken off the curriculum because it's like, you know what, we got to focus on math scores. We've got to focus on reading scores. And so there's a class element, of course. But I actually think that's one of the reasons that we should have these discussions in our homes, because across all sorts of socioeconomic status placements, these are important conversations. Power flows to people who know how to wield it. And if your kids aren't going to get that in the schools, especially if your schools are underperforming, it's even more important that you sort of take that work, work on yourself. Well, Lindsay, finally, we're I mean, under 100 days away from the election. Um, Briefly, but finally, what, what should parents be doing in, in the next three months as the television and the media is, is flooded with information about politics, some of it true, some of it not, some of it inflammatory, some of it quite educational? What advice would you give parents in the next 100 days in terms of giving them the opportunity to raise a citizen? If you have kids who are 18 to 22, this is their first time participating in a presidential election, you need to teach them how to register to vote. And I think it's important that you do that where they are going to live for the election, not expect them to come home or cast an absentee ballot. So that means saying, if you're going to college, figure out what the rules are in your state. I think it's important for our kids to have this idea of federalism where they know that it's not just the presidential election. There's elections for every house member, 34 senators, tons of state elections, tons of local elections. Make sure they understand that there's different things at play and it's not all presidential hype. And I think it's important that you are willing to have conversations with them. Don't be someone who's shut off. Let them practice with you. Because oftentimes I get college students who just aren't practiced in this. They don't know how to have hard conversations. They're afraid of making people uncomfortable and they're afraid of being uncomfortable themselves. And nothing gets better if we're not okay to sit in a little discomfort. So those are the things that I would tell parents to do in the next three months.